Gallery, which is dedicated to human spaceflight on the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station. I would like to, first of all, thank our sponsor, Boeing, which makes possible this What's New in Aerospace series. I'd like to welcome our live audience, visitors from the museum, and middle schoolers from Whitner, Whittier Academic Campus here in Washington, D.C. It's good to see all you students here today. Uh, welcome also to our online audience and our television viewing audience. Uh, today's program is about science and spacewalking on the International Space Station, and I'm very pleased to introduce our guest, astronaut Chell Lindgren, a NASA astronaut who only recently returned from a five-month stay on the International Space Station. You can see a model of the International Space Station behind him. It's a facility as big as a football field in space, and it's been occupied by humans since the year 2000. Consecutively, we've had human beings in space. Uh, Chell is a very interesting person. He's a medical doctor. Uh, he is a specialist in emergency medicine and aerospace medicine. He's a dad of three children and a husband. Uh, he's a specialist in what happens to the human body in space and when one returns to Earth. So I think we're going to have a really interesting program today. Thank you for being here, Chell. Thank you so much, Dr. Neal. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I graduated from high school uh, in Northern Virginia, so um, spent a lot of time coming into D.C., and every excuse that I had uh, would come here to the, to the Air and Space Museum. Um, and so I actually have something for you all. Um, this is my mission oh. presentation board, and, uh, and it says, presented to the uh, Smithsonian National Air and Space uh, Museum, Washington, D.C., from the International Space Station crew of Expedition 44 and 45. So thank you so much thank uh, you for very having me much. today. Thank you very much. <laughs> As chair of the Space History Department, I will be delighted to add this to our collection. Wow. Um, we're going to do a very format program today. Some of it's going to be conversation. Uh, some of it is going to be a video and uh, some of it's going to be questions and answers from the audience. So be thinking about what you want to know. And we're going to start by just sitting and chatting Great. for a minute. Um, I'd love to know, uh, Chell, about your journey to becoming an astronaut. We have middle schoolers and younger here today. Can you share with us what were you like when you were their age? What were you interested in? What were you doing? Sure. Well, I've wanted to be an astronaut for as long as I can remember. Um, I, uh, I think I was inspired by growing up, uh, I was an Air Force, uh, grew up in an Air Force family, so surrounded by planes and, and pilots. Um, <laughs> I read a lot when I was young, and, and uh, that played an important part, uh, I think, in <clears throat> inspiring me to, to pursue this. So lots of science fiction and also watching a lot of movies. Um, and all of that together, I think, uh, really gave me the inspiration to pursue this path. Um, but I feel very blessed. Uh, you know, I think about it as a journey, and, and I've had a lot of people walk alongside me uh, during that journey uh, to space. And, and so teachers, instructors, mentors, coaches, um, and family, my parents are actually here today, uh, who, you know, were incredibly supportive uh, of this dream. And so I'm very grateful uh, to, to, to my parents, grateful to my family and friends, and to all those people that really kind of invested in me um, as I, I pursued this goal. Um, I think, uh, well, in middle school, I was interested in, in planes and, and, uh, and space uh, movies and hanging out with my friends. Um, but uh, I think it's important, even at the age of middle school, uh, I think if you're, if you're very young, for those that are interested in, in joining us, uh, joining us in exploration or just joining us at NASA, um, reading is critically important and uh, it just increases your vocabulary, it creates pathways in your brain um, for learning and it was so fundamentally important to me. I like to say that reading, that books paved my uh, path to space. Um, that I actually put a, uh, let's see, here it is, I put a book at the bottom of my expedition patch um, just to represent how foundational it was uh, to my experience. Um, I think uh, if you're interested in, in, uh, in becoming an astronaut, you know, you find where you have a passion, where you have a talent, um, and you pursue that. And if it's within the domain 
that we are choosing astronauts from right now. So science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, you know, that's where we go to, to look for our new astronauts, for our new explorers. And it's doubly important to be talking um, with you all this morning because you all are the generation that's going to go to Mars. Um, you all are going to be building our, the rockets that take us there. And there's, it's somebody in your generation that's going to put that first step on Mars. So I'm, I'm very excited to see you all here today. It's good to hear you comment on the importance of reading, too, though, because I think with the emphasis on STEM, uh, we also often uh, kind of neglect or undervalue uh, the humanities, mm -hmm. uh, the importance of being literate, being able to communicate well, uh, and just being a well-versed person, a well-rounded person. So. Well, I know that there's, there's even a push now to include arts in that, in that mm -hmm. acronym, so STEAM, STEAM. Uh, you know, A standing for arts. And I think that's critically important because, you know, we, we have scientists and engineers, doctors um, and pilots, they're getting us into space, uh, but we are desperate to communicate that experience. And so uh, having read a lot, being able to communicate, to be able to communicate that experience through um, the mediums of film, through uh, words, uh, maybe even through poetry or painting, that is how we can reach out and share that experience even, even more. So um, I think it's critically important though, especially for the, uh, for the kids in the audience, um, as you decide what you want to do, you, you really want to identify that area where you have a passion and a talent because that's what you're going to be good at. Um, and, and NASA looks in all those various disciplines for the best people in the field. And if you're good at something, you're going you're gonna to do great. So you were passionate about aircraft and you went to the Air Force Academy, but you came into the astronaut corps through a different path. That's through, right. Through medicine. That's uh, right. Would you like to talk about that? When, when did you develop that interest in becoming a physician? Sure. Well, uh, even in high school, I, I had an interest and a talent for biology. Um, and while I was at the Air Force Academy, I figured out that, uh, that that's really where my passion and talent lay. I, I went into the Air Force Academy thinking I wanted to do astronautical or aeronautical engineering, um, but I really found uh, that I was good at biology. And so I studied pre-med, um, and I was also interested in service. So the trick about pursuing that goal of becoming an astronaut is that I recognized that it was, it seemed like a near impossible thing to do. And so I pursued a goal, um, a career that, uh, that I knew that, that would, would challenge me, um, it would provide me the opportunity to serve, uh, which is uh, a priority for me as well, and, uh, and something that I could do for the rest of my life. And so that's why I pursued medicine. Um, but I still had that passion for human spaceflight, and so found ways that I could kind of merge those two domains and uh, went off to study aerospace medicine after I had done uh, emergency medicine, and then got a job as a physician at, uh, at Johnson Space Center and served as a flight surgeon there for a couple of years before I got selected into the astronaut office. That was very smart of you, I think, to pursue your passion and um, in a field where you knew you could build a career because thousands of people apply to become an astronaut and 5, 10, 20, maybe 35 at the most at a time are ever selected. So right. it's almost as hard as becoming a professional <laughs> athlete. I, you know, um, and so I feel very blessed to, to have this opportunity. Um, I think all of us look back when we're getting selected and recognize that in that group that comes out to do interviews um, that are absolutely amazing people that you're interviewing with. And, uh, and the stats at that time, we interview 120 people and, and for our class we chose nine. Um, so it was like one out of 20 people were, would, would get chosen from that small interview group. And, um, and any one of those people could have done this job as well or better that, than I'm doing. And, uh, and so it's very humbling to, to get to do it, recognizing the amazing people that, uh, that you went through the interview process with. Now you did something rather unusual and extraordinary when you were at the Air Force Academy. Can you share that with us? I'm not sure what you're referring to. You're competitive. <laughs> oh, you, you, I see, yeah. Um, so I was on the parachute team at the Air Force Academy um, and had the opportunity again to serve as a, a jump master, an instructor. We have a, a unique program at the Air Force Academy where we put our students out in free fall on their very first jump. So no static line, not a tandem jump. They go out on their own with their parachute into free fall and, uh, and deploy their parachutes. And so it's an, amazing, um, it's an amazing team to be a part of and amazing to, to get to invest in, in these other cadets, these other students 
to help them achieve this uh, pretty amazing um, opportunity of, of getting to free fall parachute. And then you compete with other teams? That's right. So I was on the competition team. So in addition to being a jump master and instructor, um, I was on the competition team. And so our, the Air Force Academy has a tremendous record of uh, just many years of being the intercollegiate uh, champions. And, our, and they're so good now that they've gone on to compete at national competition, not just with other college students, but inter with international parachutists and, and do very well there and as so well. So can you give us an example of what is a competitive event? Are you yeah. trying to land exactly on that X that's on actually, the floor? That's actually one of okay. the domains. It's um, called accuracy. And so you jump out at you know, thousands of feet and try to touch your heel on a dot the size of a dime as you land. And so, um, so that's one of the competitions. Another one is uh, formations. So jumping out with, with uh, three other people, a formation of four, and doing as many formations as you can in a given amount of time. Uh, so that must be so much fun. It's incredible, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, goodness. Well, um, all of this sounds like, you know, an extremely successful path to becoming an astronaut and fulfilling your childhood dream. But did you ever have any setbacks, or uh, did you ever kind of miss one of your goals along the way? Absolutely. So I talk about this quite a bit um, when I have the opportunity to talk with kids and with uh, university students. You know, I think about my time on the International Space Station is uh, just one leg, one amazing part of an overall extraordinary journey. And so I think all of us are on a path. Um, for me, my destination, my goal was to become an astronaut. Um, but that path is not an even, an even path. It's not a, an easy one. And there are valleys and there are peaks along the way. And the peaks, those mountains, are, are the challenges that we get to choose, uh, going to college or um, pursuing a, some type of a professional goal. It's, it's difficult, and as you're climbing that mountain, you're developing skills that you're tucking away for future, um, for future challenges, and as you get to the peak. So as you graduate from high school, as you're graduating from college, your view of that challenge, of that, um, your view of that destination, that goal, becomes all, all the more clear. Um, but there are valleys along the way too, and you don't get to choose those. You slip into those, um, and, and those are difficult uh, places to climb out of as well. But as you climb out of those valleys, um, you are also building skills uh, and becoming resilient uh, for future challenges as well. Building so for character. Building too. character, absolutely. Right. Uh, so for myself, and I'll just ask the audience, who thinks that uh, the path to becoming an astronaut, that thinking uh, that being medically uh, washed out of pilot training and being discharged from the Air Force is a good uh, building foundation for becoming an astronaut? Yeah, that doesn't sound Probably too good. Not. Yeah, that's what happened to me. So I was uh, I was in the Air Force, even though I was pre-med, I went to pilot training, um, but I was diagnosed with a medical condition and ultimately uh, discharged from the Air Force. And and so that was for me absolutely, I mean, probably the most devastating thing to happen in my professional career. And it obliterated, in my mind, any possibility of becoming an astronaut. So not only did I lose this overall dream of getting to fly in space, but just becoming a pilot. Um, was, you know, that dream also was, was, uh, was lost. Um, but again, you, when you're in that valley, you reassess your map, and, uh, and I decided, well, what are my other options? I reassessed my destination, my goal, and decided that uh, becoming a physician, that, that was still an opportunity, uh, a worthy pursuit. And, uh, and so I readjusted and, and uh, had the great, uh, really, it's just such a blessing to come back around, be reevaluated for that medical condition, um, to have it established as not an issue, and then ultimately to, to get to, to where I am today. Second chance. Yep. And so I look back on that, despite uh, being um, an, an, an incredible challenge, um, I look back at the path that I've taken, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So. Well, why don't we move to some questions Absolutely. now? I'm sure people have um, questions they would like to ask you, and our first one will be coming to us from online. Okay, great. Um, and the question is, how are the spacesuits stored on the space station? All right, that's a great question. So we have the spacesuits that we wear in the capsule, um, our launch and entry suits. They're pressure suits that we would just use in an emergency if uh, the capsule that we're riding in loses pressure. Those are stored in the capsule itself. Um, we dry them out after we wear them. 
uh, so that mold and, and nasty stuff doesn't grow inside of it. And then, we, uh, and then we store those in the spacecraft. Our EMUs, the big puffy white spacesuits that we wear on spacewalks, um, those are generally stored in the airlock. Uh, two of them are mounted on the side of the equipment lock where we would actually go to put them on. And the rest of them are kind of stuffed back into the crew lock, the, the area that when we're getting ready to do a spacewalk that is actually taken down to vacuum. Um, that's where we keep those spacesuits. The two that are hanging there on the wall almost look like another person. They do, absolutely. Yeah, so if you're not ready to see them hanging out there, it can be a little bit of a surprise. Exactly. I see we have a fellow here with a question. Awesome. What, what does it feel like to be in space? It, like to, be to be weightless? It's amazing. And so you see, when you see uh, television shows or movies where astronauts are floating, um, it's an incredible thing. It's hard to describe. You just you just, uh, you're hanging there in the middle of the, the module, um, and it's not something that you've ever really had the opportunity to experience before, but that is what it's like for the entire time that you're up there. So it takes a little bit of time to get used to, but it's lots of fun to be able to float around to get from one place to another, to pretend like you're a Superman, and, uh, and to be able to move huge pieces of equipment around um, by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I think you so much for that question. Play a little bit when they're in we space. Do, don't we do. We do goof around a little bit, um, <laughs> and and actually, I'm going to show you all my post-flight uh, video here in a little while. And okay. So we we we'll see some I'll show you a little bit of that. Yeah. All right. Another question. How long have I been with NASA? Well, I've been uh, working for NASA for about nine years. Um, I started. Uh, as a flight surgeon, so as a physician that takes care of the astronauts, that takes care of the crew. Um, and most of that time was actually spent in Russia, uh, supporting the astronauts that are out there training um, in Star City. And then after two years, I, I applied when we had an astronaut selection and, and got selected into the astronaut office, and that was in 2009. So I've been an astronaut for about seven years. Thank you. Absolutely. They keep us busy on the space station. So the question had to do with what's a typical day like? Well, um, our first scheduled activity is at seven, about 7.30. So most of us will get up at about 6 or 6.30. Uh, I just set a watch alarm to wake me up. Uh, and I only slept through it one time while I was up there, much to the enjoyment of my crewmates. Um, but uh, when we get up, we do all of the morning hygiene things that you do down here, use the bathroom, shave, brush my teeth, uh, and then we'll make I'll make my first uh, bag of morning coffee and then look at the day's schedule to see if there's anything I need to be prepared for. I'll eat breakfast and then we'll get ready for um, our morning conference at about 7.30 where we talk with the ground about the day's activities. After that, we, we, we hit the ground running or hit the ground floating, I guess. Um, and that's doing science, doing maintenance on the space station. We do two and a half hours of exercise every day, so we fit that in there. We get an hour off for lunch and then it's back to work until seven o'clock at night when we have our evening conference. We talk with the ground again to kind of sum up the day, talk about the next day's activities, and then, uh, and then the, the time after that is our own. So I'll spend that uh, eating dinner, responding to email, um, talking with friends and family on the phone, and then going to bed around 10 or 11. So you're welcome, thank you. And that's an amazing thing. You can now pick up the phone and call your friends and family. It's, uh, it's incredible and it's fun to, call down to earth and surprise people. Um, the connection is even better than my cell phone connection, so it freaks people out a little bit because they're like, I thought you were on the space station, but uh, it's a lot of fun. Well, speaking of that, I'd like to transition to the next segment. Uh, we'll have some more Q&A in a few minutes, but I'd like to transition to the next segment by playing a voicemail message that I had on my office telephone here a few months ago. A message. Hey, Dr. Neal, it's Joe Lingren calling from uh, the International Space Station. I was uh, just going through um, my uh, personal stowage, and I have both the uh, Gemini 4 patch and the uh, Air and Space Museum flag. I took pictures of those in the cupola for you all. I'm look forward, looking forward to, to bringing those back to you uh, once I get back from my mission. Things are going great up here. A little over halfway done, and we got some exciting stuff on the horizon still. A couple of spacewalks here in, in the at the end of the month and uh, uh, sickness capture and, and greeting uh, new crew coming up in uh, December. So 
catching up with you. Uh, try and uh, call back soon. Bye-bye. That was kind of a mundane message for calling from the space station, huh? <laughs> that is the first call from space I have ever received. <laughs> that was not fake. We didn't record that. That was actually on my voicemail. And about three hours later, the phone rang again, and this time I was at my desk, and I picked it up, and it started the same way. Dr. Neil, this is Chell Lindgren calling from the International Space Station. Uh, that was one of those... It only happens once kind of days. I marked that in my calendar. But I think that's a, a good intro uh, to turning the program over to Chell, letting him show us uh, his highlights video from his time on the space station. Are you going to be making some commentary? Yeah, as I'll, it talk, shows? I'll talk us through the, the okay. video. Perfect. And then we'll do some more question and answer after that. Wonderful. So get comfortable, watch the movie. And we can even take the lights down here in the middle if we want. So uh, if you're looking at the screen, you know, our journey to space starts um, much earlier than just arriving at the launch pad. It, it requires uh, several years of training, two and a half years of training just to become eligible to fly in space, and then two years of uh, mission-specific training. And that training starts at, at JSC, but uh, ends up out in Star City, Russia, where we do our final exams in preparation for our launch. And then two weeks later, uh, well, two weeks prior to launch, we make our way out to Baikonur. Um, we don our spacesuits and march out to our rocket. Does that spacesuit make my butt look big? <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys are thinking that. We have the opportunity to, uh, for one last uh, wave goodbye to our friends and family. And then we climb up into the, the capsule of the at the top of that Soyuz rocket. We make our final preparations and then await our launch. Now this is the way to go to space since the shuttle retired, right? That's right. So this, we're only uh, flying in the, the Soyuz rocket now. Um, it's interesting, the shuttle leaps off of the, the uh, launch gantry once the solid rocket booster is light. Um, for the Soyuz, we actually don't know that we've lifted off unless we see the, the, the clock counting up. And that's because it takes a while to build up enough thrust to, to lift the rocket off of the launch gantry and into the air. But those Gs build up very quickly up to about three and a half Gs. And then after about eight and a half minutes, um, the third stage will shut down and throw us forward into our straps. And that's when we know that we've made it into orbit. Now you see that bright white light coming through the window. Um, that was my first, uh, first view of the Earth, of the beautiful blue and white crescent of the Earth shining um, below us, and it's a memory that I will never forget. Now, it takes us eight and a half minutes to get into orbit, but an additional um, six hours to catch up with the space station. And so during that time, we're making sure that uh, the vehicle is performing correctly, we're speaking with the ground, um, but we're strapped down in the fetal position in the capsule uh, and it's pretty uncomfortable so we are greatly anticipating getting to be get out of our seats and to get into the wider volume of the space station and it's uh, it's an amazing view to see the space station hanging there above the earth um, and this slow dance where we are approaching the, the space station and our capsule are both flying 17,500 miles per hour and yet we are able to, to slowly approach and, uh, and do our final, final docking. Another memory that I will never forget is the first time that, uh, that we opened that hatch and see the, our colleagues, our friends, our crewmates floating there in the space station welcoming, welcoming us to our new home for the next five months. And so that's Oleg Kononyeko, my Soyuz commander. There, there I am, and then I'm followed by Kimi Ayui, my Japanese crewmate. And the first thing that we do is we fly, float into uh, the service module for, for a brief uh, conversation with our family and friends that are still down in Baikonur um, in an auditorium so that we can uh, chat with them briefly about our experience.
You look happy. That's a, it's a good thing. And in the background there, there's uh, my, my youngest is asking me if that was the right of my life, and it, and it certainly was. But this is the reason that we fly to space. This is the reason that we do these long duration missions. It's to conduct science and research to extend our presence in the solar system and to improve life back here on Earth. We do that in the US laboratory. We do that here in the European Space Agency's Columbus module and here in the Japanese experiment module. This is a multi-purpose laboratory. We're doing not just one type of science, but a whole, a whole suite of science, including combustion uh, investigations. Because in the absence of gravity, there's no gravity-driven convection. That is, hot air doesn't rise. And so flames will typically consume all of the oxygen in their local environment and then extinguish themselves. And so we study flames to better understand how to harness that energy and also to prevent, uh, of course, unwanted fires in the crew cabin. Uh, another area of research is fluid dynamics. In the absence of gravity, the weaker forces of capillary uh, motion and surface tension take over. Now this is an experiment called SLOSH. Now it's very pretty, but it helps us to understand how liquids move in vessels like this and will help us understand how fuel moves in fuel tanks during vehicle maneuvers to better inform us on how to, to build our fuel tanks. This experiment is called capillary beverage and you can see that I'm drinking from a cup but in the absence of gravity. And so here, just the geometry and the materials used in that cup are helping to use capillary motion to deliver that fluid to my mouth. And this will help us move fluids like fuel and fuel tanks um, without having to use power or, or pumps. This experiment is uh, veggie. Our crew got to grow lettuce in space. Um, and we were the first US crew to get to grow and eat a crop that we had grown in space. Um, and it tasted just like lettuce. <laughs> and not, and, and uh, folks would ask me, like, what else are you growing? Or what else do you want to grow? And so I'm, I'm very excited about growing pizza. <laughs> this, uh, this is that slosh experiment again. That green tank of uh, fluid is now encapsulated in this, this orange uh, illuminated box. And instead of moving it around manually, we're using these small satellites uh, powered by carbon dioxide jets, cold gas jets, to move this around and replicate those maneuvers. Here I'm installing a, a satellite launcher uh, to be taken outside of the airlock and mounted on our robotic arm so that we can actually launch satellites from the space station. You can see one of those satellites there. These satellites are built by universities and small companies to do research. And so this research, this is the reason that we're on the space station, to conduct, to conduct this research um, to make life better for us all back here on Earth. Now, in order to do that research, we have to stay healthy. And weightlessness is incredibly hard on the human body. It's like instead of spending 141 days in space, I spent 141 days laying in bed. And so you can imagine if you laid in bed for that long period of time, your muscles would become weak, your bones would lose uh, bone mass, and your hearts wouldn't be as good responding to gravity and to exercise. And so we have three countermeasures, three exercises to prevent those changes from happening, to keep us healthy for our return back to the earth. Now those exercises include things that you would be very familiar with down here on the earth. One is we do weightlifting. There's no weight in space though, so we have a special machine called the ARED, the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. And it uses evacuated cylinders to provide up to 600 pounds of resistance so that we can do tricep extension, sit-ups, squats, deadlifts, exercises to load up our, our load-bearing bones and joints uh, to prefer, preserve our bone mass. And to, and to maintain our muscle strength. Um, to maintain cardiovascular or aerobic fitness, we have a treadmill. And you can see I'm wearing a harness that's holding me down to that treadmill. If we didn't have that, with that first step, I would go flying off the treadmill. And these, uh, these harnesses hold us down about 70% of our body weight and provide a tremendous workout. In addition, we have a cycle ergometer, an exercise bike. And you can see Kimia here exercising on that. The one major difference is that there's no seat. We don't have to sit down to exercise on a bike in space. Now, those are countermeasures. Those exercises help keep us healthy. Um, if there were a medical issue in space, we have a medical kit also to address minor medical problems. And you can see the diagnostic kit there. 
if something serious did happen in space, our first priority would be to evacuate that crew member back down to Earth. But for instance, if I had to do CPR in space, this is how you do CPR in weightlessness. You actually flip out upside down and do it. We can measure body mass in space using um, the spring constant, a, a physics equation to figure out uh, the mass at the end of a pendulum, a spring. And because of some of the changes that we experience in space, in weightlessness, we experience a fluid shift of blood and fluid up into our chest and head, which we think increases the pressure around the brain that's transmitted along the optic nerve to the eye and actually changes the structure of the eye. We have a number of tests, a diagnostic test that we do on, the, on our eyes to make sure to, to follow the changes in structure and to track our eye health. It includes fundoscopy, taking a picture of the back of the eye. Before that was ocular coherence tomography, amazing, de amazingly detailed cross sections of the, the, the globe. This is tonometry, um, where we're testing the intraocular pressure, the pressure inside the eye. We use ultrasound to look at our eyes, to look at our hearts, and also our blood vessels. We even draw our own blood in space. And uh, some of that blood comes down with us in our space vehicles, and some of it we'll put into our centrifuge, spun at tens of thousands of revolutions per minute, and then placed into our freezer on board uh, for storage until it's brought down by a future cargo vehicle. And you can see our minus 80 degree freezer right here. So that's the science that we do in space. But we do other things up there as well. Um, the, cargo, the, the, uh, the time that I was up there was during the one-year mission when Scott Kelly was up there and Misha Kornienko were up there for an entire year. Now, the Soyuz spacecraft is only good to be in space for 200 days, so we actually had a crew come up to bring up a new spacecraft for Misha and Scott. And so about halfway through our mission, we had Sergei, a Russian cosmonaut, the first Danish astronaut, Andy Mogensen, and then a Kazakh cosmonaut, Aydin Ambatov, come up to the space station for just 10 days and bring that new spacecraft up there. And so that was a phenomenal experience, having this crew up there, having a, a crew on the space station of uh, nine people instead of just the usual six. Um, it gave us an opportunity to, to hang out together, um, to do some good science, and uh, to celebrate our, our cultures. But after 10 days, it was time to say goodbye. And for all of you that have guests at your house, it's always fun to say hello, but it's always good to, to wave goodbye as well. Here Scott's trying to sneak a ride home early. We had to call him back in. Um, in addition to these vehicles that come up with crew on board, we also have cargo vehicles constantly visiting the space station, bringing food, equipment, um, scientific experiments, and other supplies. And so just a day before the end of my mission, we had the, the orbital ATK Cygnus vehicle, cargo vehicle visit, and I actually got to use the robotic arm there to grab it. So video games do come in handy. Um, and, uh, and, and having a vehicle up there is an exciting, but also a very busy time because it, uh, it requires, it takes about 30 days to unload all of that cargo off of the, the cargo vehicle to put, find a place for it in the space station, and then to pack that cargo vehicle back up with all the trash that we have on the space station for it to ultimately burn up in the atmosphere on re-entry. And we can actually turn the music up just a little bit, I think. Um, so uh, in addition to that orbital ATK vehicle, we had a Japanese HTV cargo vehicle visit, and Kimia actually got to capture that one, which was terrific. He was the first Japanese crew member to capture a Japanese cargo vehicle. And for any of those of you who do a lot of packing and unpacking, you can you probably do this too. I made a little tape ball. You can see it flying by there in the background. Um, but like I said, at the end of uh, at the end of the cargo mission, we we pulled that cargo vehicle back off the space station and sent it back to Earth to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. And my youngest uh, boy likes to say that one man's uh, dirty underwear is another man's shooting star. So be careful what you wish upon. <laughs> so that's using the robotic arm and cargo vehicle ops. One of the most amazing experiences that I had during my expedition uh, was the opportunity to do a spacewalk. In fact, two spacewalks with Scott Kelly. 
we spend hundreds of hours in the neutral buoyancy laboratory, the six million gallon pool that we have at Johnson Space Center with a mock-up of the space station in it, practicing how to use the suit, how to use the equipment, and how to stay safe during a spacewalk. It takes two weeks to get all the equipment ready inside the space station. And then ultimately the day that of uh, suit up comes where we suit up and Kimia puts us into the crew lock and locks us inside uh, and that goes down to vacuum. Another one of those profound memories that I have of my mission was that first time when I opened the hatch and looked down at the earth, rotating slowly below um, and getting to see that full face of the earth uh, in, my, in, my full, in my full vision and separated from that cold void of space by just a thin piece of plastic. Um, it is an amazing opportunity to get to, to do a spacewalk. Uh, and it's an experience that I will never forget, but it is also uh, the hardest thing that I've ever done, mentally and physically. Um, and so there's a great sense of satisfaction going outside, successfully and safely uh, performing our tasks, and then getting back inside. It, is, uh, it really drives home when you're outside that if there is an emergency, if you get tied up in your safety harness or in your, in your safety tether, um, if you get struck by a micrometeorite and develop a hole in your suit and start to, to lose pressure, that, uh, that you have an amazing team on the ground that will feed you procedures and tell you uh, what, what's, what's next. We have an amazing crew inside the space station that are keeping track of what we're doing. But if there is an issue outside, it's just you and your spacewalking partner out there uh, to get out of that bind. Um, and, and so we are amazingly grateful for the, the incredible training that we receive on the ground uh, and the support we receive from our team, both uh, before and during flight. And of course, at the end of your spacewalk, you take a selfie and, uh, and then you get back inside. So that's the work of space. That's the cargo ops, that's the maintenance, that's the science that we do on the space station. My favorite part of being in this, a part of this long duration mission was getting to really learn what it's like to live and work in that weightless environment. Um, to be in, in this environment so completely different than what we grow up in, uh, in gravity all the time. And so we have to do all the things that we do on Earth. Uh, in the morning, I shave, and so you don't need to use shaving cream in space. You just squirt water in your face, and it stays right there. This is how you get rid of uh, bed head in the morning, or sleeping bag head. Uh, this is how you wash your hair in space. We have a no rinse shampoo. Squirt it on, lather it up, and then uh, at the end you just dry it off and it works pretty well. Now I cut my own hair on the ground, so I cut my own hair in space and ended up cutting everybody else's hair too. Um, what they didn't know is that I only know one haircut, so <laughs> they all ended up with my haircut. There's our crew quarters, that's where we sleep and, and spend our, our private time. I tested the patient of my crewmates by playing the bagpipes in space, and, and uh, here I'm doing a little demo of the sleeping bag. Scott thought I looked like a great tackling dummy, so he took advantage of me there. It's completely defenseless. Now, I love coffee. Our coffee in space is pretty good. I actually miss it, but we, it's dehydrated, and it's in a pouch, like a Capri Sun pouch, and so you don't get half of the experience. You don't get to smell the aroma of the coffee. So, uh, and in addition, as the, the Air and Space Museum is well aware of all the firsts, all the great firsts have been taken. First man in, or woman in space, uh, first person on the moon. So I decided I would brew the first cup of coffee in space. Um, and so I took these pods of coffee up with me, draw, took some hot water off of our galley and pushed that through uh, into a cup and brewed the first handcrafted pour over in space. And it was, it was uh, delicious. We like, it's fun to play with stuff in space. And so here, this is a ball of water that's got an Alka-Seltzer and some food coloring in it. 
Um, here we just, uh, you just let water go and float around a little bit. Um, it's absolutely amazing. And this is what you might do if you're adventurous and want to wash your face in space. And you can see over time how surface tension is just going to carry this across my face. This is also how you can drown in just like two cups of water. <laughs> or blow bubbles. This is our dinner table. So you can see all the condiments there, but you can see that everything is Velcroed or taped or, or tucked under a bungee. Because you do not want to be the guy that loses the hot sauce. You are in big trouble. Um, I'm making breakfast that was scrambled eggs. Here are some sausage patties uh, for a, a breakfast burrito. And you can see I'm trying to lose the mustard there. But uh, meal times were a unique time to gather together with our crew. We would get together on Friday nights with our Russian colleagues to share dinner, and then, uh, and then on Saturday nights to, to watch a movie. But, and then, uh, and then we talked a little bit about what do we do to goof around a little bit. So definitely in our free time, um, we would have little competitions. This is called uh, No Hands, Somersaults Through the Lab, Through the Hatch into Node 2 Without Hitting Anything. It's a really long name for a game, but uh, <laughs> you can see I'm doing pretty well. And I know I made it there. I was pretty excited. That was the first time I ever pulled it off. I was glad I had a camera with. And we like to kind of recreate things uh, also from mo the movies that have inspired us. Here I'm doing a little 2001, trying to run around the spacecraft. Turns out running's pretty hard, so I go to bicycling instead. And of course you can do those two things on Earth. This is pretty cool. As soon as I stop bicycling, I stop moving. But can you bicycle backwards on Earth? So running and bicycling are hard work, so I just go to doing somersaults, backflips. But the thing that I think most of us truly enjoy um, is taking advantage of this amazing orbital platform and enjoying the perspective that we have from the space station, looking down at our absolutely gorgeous blue and white uh, home, our planet, the Earth. And so we have a beautiful window in the, uh, in the lab, a scientific window, where we can take video and pictures of forest fires, of the constantly changing uh, tapestry of clouds, of the, the Earth at night, storms and aurora. And we have another window called the cupola. This is a seven bay window that kind of bubbles out from the space station. And you can stick your head in that window and see the entire face of the Earth. Um, and so it's an amazing place to take photos and video, but also an amazing place to just float and reflect on this once in a lifetime opportunity of getting to live and work um, on this modern mar marvel of engineering that we have, the International Space Station. An opportunity to look back at the Earth. Again, whether you're flying over the same place twice, it's always different. The different weather, different lighting, different seasons. It's always gorgeous. Um, to see the contrast between the deep blues of the ocean and the tans of the continents. To fly over Africa and the deep browns and, uh, and, and tans of that continent. Um, unfortunately, we can see forest fires and deforestation. We can see pollution um, and the effect that humanity's had on the Earth. But we also get to see uh, gorgeous sights like the turquoise blue of the Caribbean and the dazzling whites of the glaciers and uh, snow on the mountains of the South America. You can see amazing views like uh, storm systems, like hurricanes and typhoons. You can watch the moon set. And if you stayed awake for 24 hours, you would be able to see 16 sunrises and sunsets as we go around the Earth every 92 minutes. But my, easily my favorite view Let's so look at the Earth at night, especially flying over Aurora. It's the only time that I got goosebumps on the space station. Flying over this dazzling neon cloud of green, purple, and, uh, and reds. Um, and occasionally the lighting is, is perfect to see uh, this beautiful Milky Way that we are a part of. But for our crew, at the end of 141 days, 
uh, and for Scott, 340 days in space, it meant that our expedition came to an end. Now that's a bittersweet time because uh, it means that um, our time on the space station with our friends, our crewmates, our colleagues is coming to an end. Um, that this experience, to get to view the Earth from that perspective, to be a part of this incredible space station team, both on orbit and on the ground is coming to an end. But that day comes, and of course we are eager to, to return back to the Earth uh, to see our family and friends. Um, so that when that day comes, we bid farewell to our, our friends, to our crewmates, uh, we get into our Soyuz spacecraft and we close the hatch. And after about an hour and a half, two hours after we've checked to make sure that all the seals are holding, that our spacecraft and our spacesuits are working properly, we'll undock from the space station and spend about an, an hour and a half to two hours orbiting the Earth until we do our deorbit burn. And that deorbit burn slows the spacecraft's orbit enough to dip our trajectory into the atmosphere, to slow us down, to decelerate. Um, and when you look outside during that deceleration, as we're plummeting through the atmosphere, we are being enveloped in, in a sheet of superheated air, of plasma. And those sparks flying by are pieces of our spaceship. So that, of course, is a little disconcerting. But, uh, but the spaceship works amazingly well. The parachute comes out and slows us down and carries us down to the Earth until we impact the ground, um, which represents our landing back on Earth. And after about 20 minutes, the search and rescue forces were there to open the hatch and to pull us out. And we were all feeling great. They pulled us out, sat us out to, to do some quick medical tests and then put us into a helicopter, took us to a regional airport where a NASA jet was waiting for us. And within 24 hours of landing in Kazakhstan in late December, we were back in Ellington, uh, near in Houston, at Ellington Field, uh, back in the arms of our family. So that, uh, that, was, my, um, that was my five months, uh, uh, my amazing five months in space that's been a part of a of an overall extraordinary journey. Thank you for sharing that with me. Wow. Wow. And, and so as just kind of a, a bookend to your earlier comments, uh, Valerie, I wanted to tell you that I am very happy that uh, to fulfill my promise uh, from my phone message, I am uh, happy to return um, this Gemini, uh, Gemini 4, patch to you, and also this National Air and Space Museum flag. Um, I'd like to, we, I flew this in celebration of the 50th anniversary of, of Ed White II's very first American spacewalk 50 years ago, and then um, I flew this in celebration of the National Air and Space Museum's 40th birthday. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I think we'll move to some uh, more questions and uh, just wanted to make the point before we do that that you ended with these beautiful images of our beautiful planet and uh, Chell had the um, task and the honor while he was in space to use an IMAX camera to film uh, these incredible vistas of Earth and that new IMAX film opens here this weekend um, it's called A Beautiful Planet. Uh, Chell is in the film, so if you come back anytime in the next few months to see the movie, you'll get to um, see Chell again in that. Um, all right, let's take your question. Hi, I'm visiting from Manila. Excellent. Um, Yep. Of course. No, it's a great question. So we do amazing things on the International Space Station. The science and research um, that we're doing uh, to make life better back here on Earth, the operational knowledge that we're gaining to extend our presence in the, in the solar system, hopefully someday to, to make that journey to Mars, is critically important. But I think that the greatest benefit that we have derived from this project um, is the international cooperation. Uh, the participation of countries all over the world, of astronauts, engineers, scientists from all over the world 
in this project is really a demonstration of what we're able to do when, as great countries, we come together to work on a peaceful project in cooperation and in collaboration rather um, than against each other. And so I think that that is uh, truly the greatest benefit of, uh, um, of the International Space Station. And that's the way that we're going to do future exploration. No one, company, or no one country uh, can undertake the tasks that lie ahead. Um, to go to Mars, it's going to require the best and brightest of all of our countries, the contribution of all of our countries working together to pull off that monumental task. Um, and so I, I truly believe that we are the best when we're working together. And so, um, and that's why I'm excited to be here today, to have the opportunity to talk with students. Uh, I see a lot of kids here in the audience. Um, this is the generation that's going to take us to Mars. This is the generation that's going to inspire us. It's the generation that's going to build the rockets uh, that take us out of low Earth orbit again. Uh, the generation that is going to put that first footprint on Mars. And so uh, for the young, young kids in the crowd, I, I just I can't emphasize enough how important it is to read. Um, reading is a portal to, to the knowledge that is necessary um, to, to get to the point where you're going to be competitive to, to become an astronaut. And then for, for the other kids in the audience, uh, just pursuing your passion, your talents, um, especially within the STEM disciplines. Science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, that is the language of, of space flight. And so you have to be fluent in that language. And, uh, and so pursue that passion, make that goal, commit to it, do something every day to advance, uh, to, 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 you know, to, to make your way on that path, on that journey to that destination. Um, and I'm very excited to, to see some of this, these, these faces exploring with us in the future. Thanks. Okay, I think we have an online question Okay, now. great. Let's see what's coming in from outside. Um, now that you're back, what's the best piece of advice that a veteran astronaut gave you before you left Earth? That's interesting. Yeah, let's see. There are a couple of things. One, I, I would share three things. Um, first of all is to take time for yourself to enjoy the experience. I think once we get up there, to have that amazing perspective from the space station, to look back at the Earth, and to see these amazing views, we immediately want to share them. We immediately grab for a camera, a still camera or a video camera, and want to film those. And so uh, some great advice that I got was, at least once a day, leave the camera behind, regardless of what you're looking at, and just float there and experience it with your own eyes and enjoy that experience. Because I think we are so, we, we are so busy up there and so eager to share the experience that sometimes we miss some of the experience for ourselves. Um, and then uh, I guess an, a second piece of advice was to, to leave some reserve. You know, again, we're so busy up there, and I think that sometimes we will uh, cheat ourselves on, on sleep a little bit just to, to fit every, as much into a day as we can um, to really protect that sleep so that we don't get tired, we don't get fatigued, uh, so that we can do the, the job that we're supposed to be doing up there, but also leaving a little bit in reserve both in the space station and during our spacewalks because there's always a chance of uh, an emergency. And, uh, and so um, you have to have enough reserve to be able to deal with those unexpected situations coming up. I think those are probably the two best pieces of advice that I got. And with respect to sharing, you were very active on social media, weren't you? Twitter well, and Instagram? Well, I think uh, not as uh, active as some, but uh, um, I tried to find something at least every, every day or so that uh, really stood out to me in terms of the experience that we were having or maybe a photo that I had taken uh, to, sh again, share that experience with friends, family, and people interested in what we were doing. And that's really an amazing aspect of social media. You know, um, previously in previous missions, w before social media, you know, of all the pictures that we took, there was somebody on the ground at NASA that kind of curated those pictures and maybe chose out one and posted it to a NASA website. And so if you were interested in what we were doing, you had to go to a NASA website to find that picture. And now we get to choose those photos. We get to choose those experiences. And, and really share them within minutes of, of, uh, of taking or experiencing that particular view. It's a great way it's, to bring space flight down to Earth. Absolutely. Okay, a question? What exactly was my mission? That is a great question. So we are all trained, so whether you're a, a doctor, an engineer, or a pilot, we all get trained to do the same stuff. So we get trained to do the science on the space station, to do maintenance, to do spacewalks, to use the robotic arm, um, to do all of those things. And so we aren't in charge of our schedule. The ground spends hours and hours 
figuring out the, what the priorities are and figuring out the best way to do things and then basically creates a schedule for us uh, to do. So it's, it's, it's hard work, um, but we get great training. We have a great team. It's amazing to be a part of such an amazing team um, at NASA and with our international partners um, to, to be successful at, at these very challenging tasks. Okay. What did I eat in space? Well, I ate lettuce. You probably saw that, right? Yeah. Um, and then our other food is, half of it is, is this sounds really appetizing, thermostabilized and irradiated. So it's prepared, it's already prepared, and it's in these, uh, in these sealed bags. And so you basically go to the pantry and you choose out, well, I'm gonna have, gonna have beef stroganoff today or beef steak or grilled chicken and you stick it in the food warmer, and then the other half is uh, dehydrated. And so a lot of our desserts and snacks and those sorts of things are dehydrated. And so we put either hot or cold water in there, depending on what the food is supposed to be like, and that's what makes up our menu. And they do a pretty good job of variety for us, but unfortunately, once you've been up there for several weeks, the menu starts to repeat itself and gets kind of old after a while. Thank you for that question. All right, thank you to our audience uh, here in the museum, our audience online, and our audience on television for joining us today. Uh, thank you to Boeing, our sponsor uh, for this program, but most of all, thank you to astronaut Chell Lindgren for spending this hour wow. with us and sharing your experience so well. Thank you so much. It's been a thrill. Well, Who wants to go to space? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to I want to thank you for having me today. Uh, thank you for inspiring me and uh, my colleagues to to chase this dream. And thank you for inspiring uh, our future explorers. Thank you, you so are much. Welcome. Our pleasure. Thank you, Chill. Thank you so much, Dr. Man. I appreciate it. <laughs>